Um, thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to come here at SLU and uh, present our project, Organofinery, which we um, has got financed from a green uh, development and demonstration uh, program in Denmark, GUDP, in collaboration with ICROF, Organic RDD programs in, in Denmark. So it's a, an organic program. But I'm not normally just working with uh, organic uh, agriculture, but also conventional culture, agriculture. And that, I mean, I'm working generally with biorefining. So it's uh, the first time that I actually have been so heavily involved in organic farming. So that's really interesting. The idea in the program is to go from green crops to uh, proteins, energy, and fertilizer. And the outline of the talk will be that I will just briefly tell about my background, our research at Aalborg University, and of course the concept and visions of the Organofinery project. I will uh, explain some of the results obtained so far and our future plans. It's from started in 2015, no, 2014, and it will end in 2017. So we're actually in the middle of the uh, project, I can say. Then I will tell a little bit about other protein biorefinery programs because in Denmark this is, I could say, a hot topic. Actually, tomorrow I will attend a workshop about green biorefinery uh, projects in Denmark where we discuss the future of that for agriculture in Denmark. So it's really, a, I don't know if a hype program in Denmark is about protein biorefining and I don't know the situation about Sweden so I don't know if that is also very hot in Sweden at the moment and I would be happy to take in questions and and di uh, discussions and so on afterwards so my background is that actually I have a master degree from uh, the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University which now is Copenhagen University so I'm an economist as background but I turned myself into molecular biology and biotechnology and uh, I have been working as a PhD student, assistant associate professor at Copenhagen University within plant diseases, biological control of plant diseases, interactions of microbes and plants and, and things like that. And actually my old supervisor Dan von Gensen is also present today. He is now a professor at SLU um, in plant pathology. I was there until 2007, and then I briefly moved to the Danish Technical University, uh, joining a biorefining group there, which the whole group actually moved to Aalborg University from 2008, where I have been working with building up biorefinery processes, focusing on utilization of lignocellulosic... Oh, sorry, that was not the pointer. which has been focusing on utilization of lignocellulosic biomass, uh, especially in somatic conversion, but also protein extraction methods. And I'm heavily involved in development of biocatalysts for production of enzymes, biochemicals, etc., biomaterials uh, using metabolic engineering. So I'm still also working with molecular biology besides being involved in, in this program here. What is Olber University doing in Copenhagen? That's a question, of course. But Olber University here, Olber is a city in Jutland. It has a satellite in Esbjerg that is actually very much related to uh, oil refining and s stuff that is going out in the North Sea. And then we have this satellite in Copenhagen, and that's actually you could say random, that it was started out because some students didn't want to go to Aalborg to take some educations in Aalborg, and therefore it started out in the basement in some houses in Copenhagen, and then it grew, it grew, it became very popular because Aalborg University has a different learning style. It's a problem-based learning for the students instead of, you know, just have lectures and sit and listening. And then we built up this group in sustainable biotechnology, where I am now. And he here's just so you can see how it looks like today. 
because it has grown very fast from starting in 2004. And now in 2012, we moved to these facilities in, in near, very near Copenhagen cen center. It's in Copenhagen South Harbor, Sydhavn, it's called. And uh, we are placed in this building here. Our laboratories is here, so we had to build that because it's old Nokia building, so we had to build molecular biology, biorefinery labs from the scratch in these buildings two, some years ago. And we are the only one at Aalborg University that has exper experiment going on in this building. Furthermore, I can say now that it's like 3,000 students, so it has grown very fast. And what do we do? In general, the section for sustainable biotechnology, it's called the place that I come from, uh, combines modern biotechnology with process technology in the development of biomass-based systems for sustainable production of chemicals, fuels, feed, food, and etc. And the researchers that are there are having very different backgrounds, so it's really multidisciplinary. I'm the only economist. Uh, then there's microbiologists, biochemists, molecular biologists, and process engineers. Uh, and the main objectives of our research there are these uh, biorefineries. We have, ah, oh, I have to learn how to use this one, sorry. We have um, a, both a master and a bachelor education in sustainable biotechnology. And we also offer PhD courses in biorefineries and a PhD course in anaerobic digestion. And as you maybe know, this is a very simple sketch for a biorefinery. You have the agricultural products, the cellulosic, lignocellulosic feedstock. Then it should be pre-treated. And then you can deconstruct the biomass by enzymes. Uh, and then you add up having simple sugars that you can ferment, eventually producing bioethanol. But you can also produce all kinds of other products within this uh, fermentation processes. Um, so that is, you, you could say, the main thing, and we are going the whole way. We are not making the agri agricultural part, but taking in from here, we go all the way to here by having separation steps and knowledge about all these kind of different elements that it takes to convert biomass. When we started out, we were so lucky to get a very uh, big, uh, big in a Danish scale, a uh, research program. Uh, called biorefinery, and the idea was to develop a biorefinery concept for integrated production of biomedicals, biochemicals, feed, and fuels from selected plant materials. And in this program, we took in uh, a green crop, alfalfa, and we did that because we had a small company that has invented, that started invented a method for protein extraction because you know these. Um, Plants from the pea, the pea plants have a high protein content. And to take that out of the plant first and using them for food and feed purposes, then it gives that you have the rest of the plant that you could pre-treat. You could get the lignocellulosic out with pre-treatment with an enzyme treatment and go to the sugars, biofuels, biochemicals, which were along our line here. Uh, and we also have worked a lot with enzymes and finding new enzymes in the nature and so on. And Copenhagen University also were involved and they were looking and screening the plant materials if there was some of the plant materials that could be used as biomedicine. And that is actually some of these uh, plants within the pea family all uh, really have some interesting uh, components like phytoestrogens or other things that actually could be very interesting for uh, medicine purposes, but we didn't go come so far in this program with that. Going further to the organofinery, this part here was very, very successful, and therefore we want to take that a further step. Within this uh, program, the idea was to have the alfalfa plant, we disintegrated it in a pulp 
and a green juice just taking the plant sap away from the plant. And this have all the soluble proteins in it, so we recovered the proteins and got brown juice and we got the protein uh, recovered by a sulfuric acid precipitation method that lowered the pH and then could uh, precipitate the proteins which you can harvest by centrifugation. And we, uh, uh, the biotest person also invented a method to make human uh, functional proteins that could be used for humans. And the leftover could be used for other purposes, but that was just, you know, some thoughts that we had at that time. Uh, but all these ideas went into this organofinery project because we met some people that were very interested in the technology that we invented in the other program. And therefore, we decided to set up this whole project here. So the idea is to have organically grown biomass of different kinds to fractionate that exactly similar to what we did before. And that is in a very simple machine called a screw press, where you just press the sap out of the plants. The trick is that it has to be very fresh, because if it's, for example, lay on the field for a period, then the uh, proteins will start be degraded. So you need to have very, very fresh material here. Make this screw pressing immediately, or after a few hours after harvest. That's one of the uh, obstacles that you have here. And then you get this green juice, the green plant juice, which you then precipitate and get an organic feed and you get uh, the leftovers, the press cake combined with the leftover from, from the precipitation. You can put into the biogas plant and make biogas and the digest that from that is a fertilizer product that can go back into the fields. So uh, kind of think about all the nutrients that we reco recover, all the inorganic nutrients where there's no energy in, but those are very, very valuable. And maybe you also know that organic farming always lack uh, some fertilizers that are uh, approved organic. So if you can like solve all these problems here, then you have a good case. And one of the cases is also that this material here can't be used for uh, monogastric animals. You can only have cattle, uh, use it as cattle feed. But if you can take those proteins out, you can actually use those for monogastric animals here. The press cake in this program here, we try to put that into the biogas process, but actually the press cake is actually also an up concentration of a nice protein feed for the cattle because, and I will show you this later, that there's a lot of protein still in the press cake. So this is also another option that we are not working with in this program, but we are collaborating with others about, uh, about this part, if that is how to use max value out of this one. But if you take it out, you could say, and that is something that for discussion, if you take it out and use it as cattle feed, then you don't have so much product to go back to the field. So you have to think, what direction sh should we go for? Uh, should we? And maybe it could also be a combination that some is taking out and some are going back and so on. So it's, it's a balance if you want to have like a whole <laughs> system. The partners, because as you can say, may, uh, see, we uh, cannot solve all these issues ourselves. So Aalborg University is the project leader. We have the capacity of the both uh, this protein refining uh, process, but we also have a group working on the biogas part of the program. Um, we have this small company, Biotest, that actually in the old program invented the method and which are subcontracting to us because we work very closely together on, on the protein part of this uh, project. We collaborate with the Knowledge Center for Agricultural uh, Agriculture in Denmark called SEGIS. They have all the contacts to uh, the organic farmers. So, because we want to have like everybody involved in this project, so it's very much going 
not only at the research level, but also trying to get the research out in practical use and get people interested in it, and even try to solve some uh, problems that they have currently by having enough uh, nutrition for their farms and also about the protein uh, that they have to give to their animals. So the problem is in Denmark that you have um, now the rule that you can put 5% uh, conventional protein feed in the feed for, uh, for uh, poultry, but that has to be you phased out this rule, so in future they should put 100% organic feed. So they need a new protein resource, and that is, you can say, a driver also for the program, that there's actually some uh, driving forces that helps that we have to develop this. Um, then we have Copenhagen University involved. Uh, we have two different departments. One is working on the ecosystem with the uh, trials and, and growth studies and so on. Actually, the Knowledge Center and the Agrotech, which is now part of Technological Institute, are also working on uh, field trials to work on, on the biomass production systems and looking into that. And I'll explain more about that. Then we also have a department that works on the uh, economics of all this because one thing is what we can do, you know, that's always, we can do a lot of things on the research part, you can solve in the laboratory, you can solve a lot of small problems, but if you have to scale it up and you have to convince somebody to really invest money in this, then there needs to be business cases, otherwise people are not interested in the long end. And I think that's the same for the, you know, for biofuels and for everything. So therefore we have skilled people that know how to model this and to look at scenarios and and calculate how, how would it cost to do this. We have Aarhus University involved and they have all the agricultural facilities for making poultry feeding ex experiments because what we have decided is that we concentrate on only poultry in, the by in this program, but it could be pigs also. Uh, of the monogastric animals that we are looking at, but you know, you should prepare less food for a feed trial in poultry compared with how much food you should, or how much feed a poultry, a, fu a full scale trial would be in, in, in pigs. So therefore we decided to go for poultry. Then we have fermentation experts, that is, that is a feed production company that are, could be interested in making this on a commercial base, and that is, you know, important also to have such people involved. And finally, we have a small company, a SME, that looks into uh, the market potential, again, for the sake of business cases. So the project seeks to deliver solutions to the following key challenges. One is to supply organic uh, protein to monogastric livestock, focusing on these poultry. And indirectly, we also, of course, look at the possibilities for pig or fish by looking at the composition analysis of the protein that we re refine and to, s to see if theoretically that could also be a valuable source for uh, feed for pigs. We also look into the whole uh, crop rotation system because we want to see if we can um, develop, improve climate-friendly and robust crop rotation suggestions in areas where there's low density of livestock and, and use have a better efficiency of nutrients and higher yields, of course, for the uh, farmers because we also need farmers to be in interested in in production and in having these um, green crops in their crop rotations as a, and as a choice. And you know, crop rotations is important, <laughs> especially in organic farming due to this nutrient cycle and legume-based cropping system where you have plants that enable the biological nitrogen fixation is important because then you have natural uh, fertilization with, with uh, nitrogen for the next coming crops. I think you all 
knows about this very simple system in crop rotation in crop rotations. So the activities that we have in the program is to identify the best suited material for, for the biorefinery through those cropping trials. It is to invent a method for harvest and extraction of the green leaf protein. As I said before, we had this sulfuric acid precipitation that is not compatible with an organic process. So instead we use fermentation where we use our microbiology knowledge and use lactic acid bacteria to ferment, to lower the pH after, after having the, the um, juice taken out from the plant. Then we add lactic acid bacteria to lower the pH and precipitate the protein out. And then we separate them, and we have done all these kind of things. So the next steps is to put... Oh, sorry again. We have to uh, produce it in larger scale, and then test it in feed trials. And then we are also uh, working with this uh, biogas experiment to test how does it work, the rest material in, in the biogas system. So all these are going to be optimized so we can upscale and involve all the people. Now I will talk about this part where we go for the biomass, and to the separation into green juice, brown juice, and so on. Just to show you some pictures, um, we have the freshly harvested crop here, and we started out using red clover as a monocrop, but later we have tested uh, other different crop types and clover grasses. We separated it in such a screw press, you can see here, just to and this is very really hand fed here. So the screw press has this size, what we have used so far. And here you can see how this uh, pulp comes out. And we get the green juice where we uh, uh, add these lactic acid bacteria ferment for fermentation and for precipitation of the proteins. And then we take all the leftovers for the biogas. And what we did then was to compare, in the first, we wanted to compare how did our new method with this lactic acid fermentation work compared with sulfuric acid precipitation and compared with what we call a natural fermentation. Because after you just take this plant juice out, it will actually start ferment naturally because due to the microorganisms that are in the plant or harvested together with the plant. And actually, all three methods works quite nicely, even the natural fermentation. The problem with the natural fermentation, which we actually, when we did it, got as much protein out as with our added uh, bacteria strain, is that you cannot rely that always you get a very nice fermentation, because probably sometimes you will get acetic acid or not. Uh, here we ensure it's a homo-fermentation process where you can have a mixed homo and hetero fermentation proce process where you get other products than lactic acid, for example acetic acid or butyric acid, which maybe the animals, when they get the feed, don't like. Lactic acid is a very good, it's you know, uh, something that also could be beneficial uh, for the animals, for their health and so on, but acetic acid, maybe they won't even eat the feed. So Therefore, this is more interesting. And it was as efficient as if we add this uh, sulfuric acid. So now we have a very good organic method. And we have actually made a patent on that that was just released here before Christmas. Um, so here's just pictures how we have ha harvested. You can see this is me. It's out in the fields. It was uh, together with uh, at the field trials at uh, Copenhagen University, and we just cut it by hand, put it into that, and made the fermentation here. And this is just the bacteria that we add. And here you can see how this protein paste looks like. And here you can see maybe I, I don't know how clear it is, the brown juice and the green uh, precipitated proteins in the in the bottom. So the green color 
or the chloroplast actually goes together with the proteins. And that's, that's why we call it brown juice. This part and the green protein paste. So all the green you get out, you keep the green here, you could see. And again, this is just pictures to show how it looks like. And that is, you could say, the three products. You get a press cake that can be used for biogas or for cattle feed. You get the brown juice that can be used as a nutrition or fermentation medium or for biogas. And you, can, you have this protein paste for, as a feed product. And what do you get out when you do this from a plant? If you think about the pr protein that is in a plant, if that you set that to 100%, then actually only a third part is coming out in the green juice and two-thirds is left in the press cake still. And that is why we think that it could be really relevant also as a cattle feed. Um, the brown juice still have a little bit of proteins left, so in some you get around 20% recovered of the proteins. You don't get 100% or half of the proteins. You get, you lose like a lot of proteins here if you just think about it as a product, a protein product. But of course you can make use of all the other things since you still have some and that is low molecular weight amino acids that are in the brown juice. It's really nutritious for as a fermentation medium. We have tested it. At, it can be used for production of different com compounds and a lot of organisms like to grow it. Right now we have uh, tried to see if we can produce lactic acid, which is, you could say, a bioplastic in future. So we also invent what can we use all these fractions for. But as you can see, the numbers, uh, that is what we can do. We can, of course, try to see if we can recover much more of the protein by different treatments of the fresh crop, like treat with enzyme 8 or ultra um, UV, uh, or no, microwave, that was what I meant, microwave treatment or other things to open up and get more proteins out. But it depends very much of what do you want with, for example, the press cake. Do you want that for the cattle feed? Then maybe this is a nice combination of how to have it. Some people want to take the press cake and put water together and try to extract more sap out and get more out. And we also look into these kind of things. But that is, you know, a final choose is also to have maybe a very simple process that can be come out in large scale instead of trying to do too much complicated things if we really want to, to get it out to work in real world. Um, so this is just to show the distribution we have made, you know, composition analysis of our fractions. And if you take a fresh crop, you have a lot of cellulose, that's the green one. You can see the protein paste, very little cellulose left. This is uh, the protein is here, and you see how much up concentration you have of proteins in the protein paste. But you also see that the protein paste is not just proteins. You still have something else. And in our case, we of course have uh, lactate also. We have like five to seven percent uh, lactic acid in, in the protein paste. But we actually consider that that could be really good for the as, as a feed also, together with the feed, just for stabilization and, and I mean, for um, and also as a co-nutrition factor, because we think that it has a good health effect, as I said before. And here you just see how much raw protein in dry matter, and you can see from the initial plant and until uh, we have up concentrated, so in dry matter you really have a high uh, protein content when we have this protein paste compared with the with the crop itself. Then we have made amino acid composition analysis, and it's very important. Normally, organic protein feed is based on import soybean, so we use soybean as a you know a comparison for for how 
was the amino acid in our product compared with the um, soybean. And the composition of those are also very important as feed products, especially a uh, high content of methionine is important for poultry feed, whereas a uh, high content of lysine is important for pig feed, according to our collaborators. I'm not expert on these issues. Um, but data from our red clover, and it, that it's very similar to our clover graphs, I could say, is that here we have all the different amino acids. I have highlighted methionine. In the fresh material, we have 3.1 gram per kilo dry matter. In the protein concentrate, 8.5. And in the soybean, you have 7.7. .7, so you see it's really even better, actually, but it's very comparable on the methionine and our poultry uh, collaborat collaborator who actually made these amino acid analyses was really happy about it, so she's very optimistic about it. So another result is how much do we get out from a plant? So 5-10 kilo is what we get out from one ton, so we can see it's not a very high yield. So we come back to the economy. <laughs> 5 to 10 percent uh, of the protein from the plant are extracted, and the remaining part is in the press cake and in the brown juice. Amino acid composition is very favorable for poultry, at least as good as soy feed. Then after all this laboratory testing, we went actually to a pilot scale uh, facility together with some people uh, at Folum in Aarhus University because they have built out, um, as I said, it's very hype in Denmark to make this protein biorefining, and they have got a lot of money at Aarhus University to build facilities for uh, as, uh, different kinds of biomass treatment, and they also have a screw pressing system for protein biorefining, and or protein extraction, you could say. So they have this screw press, you can see part of it here, and we had this very uh, collaboration uh, with them, and they just built it. They said that they would have done it in August, but it was delayed until late October. So it was a very, very late harvest we did. And this was their first trial. They, we had the opportunity to use our uh, material and connections and all this on their uh, facilities. So they also worked together with us to get all the, uh, you could say, the knowledge about how did it work. And uh, we had to buy a fermenter because the Aarhus people do not work with fermentation. They work with another protein extraction method, completely different from what we work with. Their protein extraction method is based on heat treatment where they heat up the proteins uh, so they will coagulate, which we think is not so good. But <laughs> that's another discussion because you, you lose also their functionality by this heat treatment. But that is an old way of when potato you get proteins out for potatoes, they also use this kind of method. So it's an old invented method. So we had to buy these big scale or pilot scale fermenters for doing our process. And that is right now placed at Aarhus University. They have they house it for us. And we um, actually got really good results, but the school press in the middle of our program broke. We also don't think they have bought the best screw press. That's also another thing. We could have told them what they should have done, but <laughs> so. But at least we got 55 kilo dry protein out, and and we couldn't have more time because it, it broke. And you know, it was October. We couldn't harvest later, and so on. So and we needed 200 kilos. So we decided to uh, wait with our feeding trials. We actually had the hens ready and everything, so it was actually very disappointing, I could say. But we got a lot of good experience that can be taken to, to uh, 2016. Okay, going from the protein part to the biogas. I'll do the next things very much quicker. Just to remind, you have this material here, you have the liquid where you take out the protein, so you have the brown juice left, and then you have the press cake. 
and these two things are combined. You can also add the bacteria, the same bacteria or other bacteria for fermentation or silaging of the press cake, because that might also increase the digestibility of, of that material. And here you can see the uh, lab scale fermentation, uh, biogas fermentation process or digestion process. And uh, it seems like we got good results. There's a lot of nutrients to run the biogas process with the leftover materials. And uh, both the, the um, press cake and the, uh, the brown juice, you can use them separately, but you can also combine them because there's not high solid load in the brown juice, of course, because you have taken out most of the material, but it's very easy to digest. As it, I also said, it's a good fermentation substrate. But of course, economy will tell whether the press cake should go into biogas or it should be used for other purposes. So up to 85% actually of the fresh co crop, if you have a fresh crop and you look for, for the, um, for the uh, biogas potential of a fresh crop, putting the whole crop in uh, digested, you actually have 85% left when we digest all the leftover material. So you don't lose so much energy by taking out the proteins, you could say in other words. Then I briefly touch upon this agro-eco system. We had to choose plant species, so we had, as you have heard, the red clover as a model, and then clover grass based on, on red clover and grasses. But uh, Copenhagen University also looks a lot into other plant species and look about harvest time and so on how many cuts should be done per season, two cuts, three cuts, four cuts, how early and the timing and all this. There's a lot of things in the agricultural system to look at. Uh, ah, <laughs> I don't know if I ever learned this part. With the early cut, largest juice fraction, but lowest biomass, and protein yield if you have this four cut strategy. But if you have a two, three cut strategy, you get the highest protein yield with middle to, la to late first cut. That's the uh, preliminary results that we have got. And the red clover or red clover grass give higher yield actually than the white clover and rye grass. And next year we will have a lot of more data on, on this part here. But harvesting time is very important economically. You know, fewer harvest, you have a larger and cheaper production. Then you can think about the uh, fertilization, not for legumes, but for other of the alternative plants. Will that increase the total production and increase protein concentration? But would it influence, for example, the protein quality? And for example, also, could we add sulfur as a fertilizer, will that increase uh, not only the total production, but in s especially the percentage of sulfur-containing amino acids, as, for example, methionine? So this is some of the uh, questions we explore in the program. The preliminary results is that this, this sulfur added in different amounts did not have very high uh, impact on the methionine cysteine, compared with the lysine, so the distribution was not very heavily affected, but this is very preliminary, just to explain what, how we are working with these issues. But that would be much more explored this year. So species differences, so the aim of the program is to test sub-protein quality from the different plant species, grasses, legumes, a lot of different species, crucifers, oil seed rape, oil seed radish, uh, chicory, leaf beets, and others. So it's, I mean, it's a quite large uh, amount of plants. I think there's a 22 different plant and plant blends involved in this program. In summary, uh, protein refining proved effective both in laboratory and pilot scale. 
but pressing requires robust ma machinery. Uh, the residues gave efficient biogas production. Clover grass and red clover allow a very high, uh, relatively large protein leaf, uh, yield and a good amino acid composition. So the next step is producing proteins. Um, protein field for poultry. And together with BioValue program, which I will tell in a moment, uh, the uh, press cake we want in a large scale to try to uh, make silica out of that for cattle feeding trials because we think that part is also uh, very interesting. So plans is that make a full-scale refining of 200 tons of green biomass of the grass clover in, in 2016, feeding with protein concentrate for the poultry, also make a feed product together with fermentation experts, the, the, the feed company, and test that in livestock in collaboration with organic uh, poultry producers, and make field tests and make a lot of other activities. So poultry feeding trials, 200 kilo we need to deliver, and that is a dried product, not the, the this protein paste that we make directly should be dried afterwards, otherwise we can't uh, use it. And so you can see here, digestibility will be uh, in three levels, and to be measured is growth of hens, digestibility, manure consistency, behavior, number of eggs, egg size, weight, and plum color. So a lot of things are going to be measured. Then the economy. So there will be a lot of economic calculations, but we need to provide all the numbers during the next years. So they have delayed their work until we can provide them with more accurate numbers about yield and so on. And we want to have this large-scale production so we can have more realistic numbers than from laboratory-scale uh, work. And here you can see the whole sketch about what we, the process line, harvest, pressing, and so on, in a much more large-scale scenario. And collaboration with companies, we have involved much more companies than actually were within our program along this here. We had these three companies in, in the program. But now we have also a collaborator, uh, collaborating with Nybro Teori, that is actually making uh, feed pellets for cattle and horses now. But they do it by drying out the product on the fields before they take it in, because they don't want all this juice that we want. So we need to convince them that they should do it differently. And they are very interested in helping us this summer. And we, have, we will order a, a large scale screw presser and put that at Nybro Teori and they have all the logistic with the organic farming people to deliver the, the material and so on. And that will be much better than this pilot scale facility. So we actually go up and really can work with these very large uh, amounts of materials. Then we have Rooney, that uh, a company that rent and sell screw presses. We have Quernland that are looking into harvest equipment, and then agricultural machinery contractors that calculate harvest and transportation costs and so on. So we have really got a lot of interest from the industry. Also, KMC, potato factory, will maybe help out by centrifugation and drying of this very large amount of protein paste, because that is also really costly. Hamlet Protein, another company, has shown interest as well. Similar Danish programs, you have Multiplant, that's an organic program, also a really a sister program. They got money at the same time as we got from our project. They have more or less all the same elements. I won't read them all, but the main difference is from our project uh, is that they have even more focus on the plant ecosystem than we have. So we really try to uh, talk together so we get we don't do double work but distribute the work. They have a very different protein precipitation method, as I mentioned, coagulation of proteins by heat, and they don't have this as a very substantial part of their program. And as and they are, don't have this upscaling and feeding trials in, in their program. 
But the other project that also, and this is run at Aarhus University, this is BioValue, a, a program that is a big biorefining program in, in Denmark with a lot of universities involved, or a lot, four different technical universities, Aalborg University, Aarhus University, and Copenhagen University. And one of their sub-projects are products from green biomass. So they want to um, go for uh, also protein, and that they uh, have built this fa pilot facility in Aarhus. But the main difference from ours is that it's non-organic here. It's a different protein precipitation method. They have no focus at all on biogas part, but instead they have this focus on cattle feed. And there is why they are very interested in our program, because if they want to make a, a large scale trial, they at the, f the pilot facility can't make enough press cake in there uh, that can feed cattle in a large scale. So therefore they join us this summer in 2016 for making this cattle feed uh, when we are going for making the protein part. So finally, breakthrough for biorefined protein. Uh, we think that because of this growing need for organic protein quality could be a driver and then if things are going in large scale and, and, and people can think that there is economy in it, then it could be that uh, conventional livestock production will follow in order to reduce dependence on soybean imports and also to have a better cropping system uh, because they get usage of, for example, uh, the um, catch crop that they are forced to do from... Uh, Maybe they can harvest that and put that into a, re a re refinery. Or they can have uh, modern intercropping systems or other things. So, that was uh, the final words for me. I hope that you didn't sleep all the way through and that you have some questions for me. <laughs>